Okay, perfect. All right, uh, welcome everybody to the MIE uh, Distinguished uh, Speaker Seminar Series. Um, I am Elias Khalil, I'm a new faculty member of, in, uh, in industrial engineering in MIE, uh, and I'm happy to host Professor Cynthia Rudin today uh, from Duke University, where she's a professor of computer science, uh, ECE and statistical science. Uh, previously, she had positions at MIT, uh, Columbia, and NYU. Um, and uh, she's made lots of contributions in uh, machine learning, machine learning theory, uh, interpretable machine learning, operations research, uh, among others. Uh, and she's a fellow of both the American Statistical Association and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Uh, and today, she's going to tell us about uh, some of some of the recent uh, work she's done on interpretable uh, machine learning. Uh, and so uh, we're happy to have Cynthia with us. Uh, for questions, please use the Q&A uh, box, not the chat box. Uh, and we'll have some time uh, for questions uh, after the talk um, for everybody, and then some more time for just uh, the student participants among us. So please, Cynthia, go ahead. Sure, I'm gonna go and share my screen. So hopefully you all can see this window that I have open. Yeah, great. Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about some of our lab's current work in interpretable machine learning. I'm just going to start with some definitions. So an interpretable machine learning model is a constrained model. So it's constrained so that it obeys the domain-specific set of constraints. Um, I'm going to give you a more formal definition. Um, it's, a, it's constrained so that it's either useful to someone or it obeys some kind of structural knowledge of the domain, such as monotonicity or you know, generative constraints or something like that. And there's a spectrum between models that are uh, really fully interpretable, kind of on the extreme end, where you can understand how all the variables are jointly related to, you know, jointly related to each other to form the final prediction. Uh, and then on the other extreme, there are models that are very gently constrained so that, for instance, they're forced to be, you know, monotonically increasing along one variable, for instance. And um, why would you need interpretable machine learning models? Well, there's two major reasons I can think of. Um, one is that you have a high stakes decision. And the other is that you are trouble that you want to be able to troubleshoot your model. So high stakes decisions are things like models that are used in the criminal justice system, credit scoring models, uh, air pollution models, um, maintenance applications, lots and lots of healthcare applications where you really don't want anything to go wrong. Um, because a lot of times AI models actually do go wrong, like really uh, go wrong. Um, so let me show you some examples of maybe some not so great AI models being used for high stakes decisions. So for instance, um, I don't know how many of you have noticed this, but when you, when you pay off a loan, your credit score goes down. Why is that, right? It's so unintuitive, right? And so perhaps it's a sign of a bad model because you, if you pay off your loan, that means you're more credit worthy, not worse, not, you know, less credit worthy. Here's another example. If you lived in California during the wildfires in 2018, you might have been using Google's daily air quality index to, or daily air quality predictions in order to uh, determine whether it was safe to go outside. And then um, you might have seen Google's predictions on that air quality was fine on days when people were also seeing a layer of ash all over their cars. <laughs> um, because during the wildfires, Google replaced the EPA's trustworthy air quality index with a proprietary machine learning model from the company Breezometer, which claimed to be more accurate. But clearly, the, this proprietary model was not doing what it was supposed to, and it put a lot of people in danger. And you know, I don't know how many children were playing outside during those days, but you know, you'd hope the layer of ash on the cars would, would have done something to deter them, but who knows. Uh, here's uh, another thing that has happened in the past where people um, realized that black people are getting worse quality health care because of their race. Um, and in particular, this hospital was ranking patients in order of their proje projected, um, projected cost for next year and then offering people who are higher cost extra services. But the problem is that, that black people are receiving lower cost health care, but that doesn't mean that they were worse off because the cost is not the same thing as the need, so it's not a good proxy. And if the model were transparent, you know, we might have we might have been able to do something about that. But in any case, so 
another thing that could happen is that um, there could be a typographical error in a black box model, and that could actually lead to years of extra prison time. So this is an example where someone was denied parole because of a miscalculated compass score. Compass is a model that is proprietary and it's used throughout the justice system and it has maybe 137 factors that go into it. And so it's, um, this is a case where he, he only noticed after his parole was denied that there was a typographical error in his criminal history features. And you know, this is not the way we want our criminal justice system to work. It shouldn't work, it shouldn't, you know, have a typo determining what your pr prison sentence is. That does, that's not right at all. Um, so you'd think that a black box model would be more accurate, but that's not always the case. And in fact, it's not even usually the case. Uh, so there's kind of a spectrum of problems uh, that it, and it really matters which problem you're working on uh, that determines kind of what the effectiveness of different algorithms are. So there are really at least two types of data. Um, the first is tabular data. So tabular data is where all the features are interpretable, like, um, like this kind of data that I have here. And this, this is the kind of data that I always end up getting. Like this is like criminal justice data, lots of healthcare data, social science data. Like I always end up with data of that kind. And um, that's as opposed to the, these data that I call raw data, where each feature is not itself understandable. So for instance, a pixel in an image um, or like a bit of a sound wave or like a word in a document, right? You, you, you can't really get any information about what the picture is by looking at just one pixel, right? Or just one word or just one bit. So these are very different types of data. Now for the, for the very raw data, that's where neural networks seem to be exceeding, um, exceeding other methods by a substantial margin right now. Doesn't mean other methods won't catch up, but right now neural networks are really the way to handle its raw data. But people are really applying neural networks to everything right now. Whereas the truth is that um, for the tabular data with minor preprocessing, all the methods seem to have pretty similar performance. Um, and in particular, that opens the door for the possibility of very sparse models because those also have very similar performance to the very complicated models. Um, so that would be that would include very sparse models like dis sparse decision trees and sparse scoring systems. Now I see this and every time I say it, everybody goes, I is she kidding? You know, like there's no way that's true because you know they must lose accuracy because they're constrained. But the truth is that they don't seem to lose accuracy most of the time. So I'm going to go back to this example of the compass score and um, talk about uh, so what, what the accuracy of compass actually is. So again, this is a proprietary model. It's used throughout the justice system. You know, the police departments purchase it. Uh, the, the criminal justice system purchases this, this model from this company. Um, and we have data from Florida that was made available by ProPublica. Um, and they've provided us with compass scores of many, many individuals in Florida. So we can actually compare compass to uh, other methods. And so at the time that uh, we got this uh, access to this data set, we compared it with our latest machine learning method that we were developing in the lab at the time, which is called CORALS, or Certifiably Optimal Rule Lists. And we said, fine, we'll do a head-to-head -head comparison. So we took the CORALS method, and we ran it on the Florida data, and we got a model that looks like this. So this model says, if you're 19 to 20 years old and you're male, predict that you'll be arrested within two years of your compass score calculation. Also, if you're 21 to 22 and you have two to three prior arrests, predict um, arrest, again, within two to two years of the compass calculation. Also, if you have more than three priors, then predict arrest, otherwise predict no arrest. And we thought, there is no way that we are gonna be as accurate as compass on this data set with that model. But the truth is that actually we were. Um, so this is um, compass versus corals. This is accuracy of these models. This, the colors are the different folds of the data set. And as you can see, they're very, very comparable. And also when we ran, um, and corals, by the way, produced the same model across, across folds. Uh, almost all the folds got exactly the same model that I showed you on the previous slide. So then we ran a whole bunch of other machine learning methods to see how they would do. And they all did very similar to, to each other. And some of these are complete black boxes like compass, which is you know, proprietary, or um, some of them are like support vector machines with radial basis function kernels or boosted decision trees with hundreds of trees. Like th these are black box models that, that add tons of things together, you know, and uh, 
you know, or exponentiate something and weight it and add it up. It's just very, very complicated functions. Whereas on the other extreme is something like corals, whose whole model is right there on the corner of the screen. And I should tell you that there was a huge debate about the fairness of algorithmic fairness of compass, but the truth is that we just don't seem to need compass at all. So <laughs> I don't know why we're still using it. But in any case, um, this problem that I mentioned, uh, or, well, this, this kind of aspect of machine learning problems that I mentioned happens very often where if you have tabula tabular data, you can get just as accurate as any other method um, using a very sparse model. So that really opens up opportunities for us to work hard on not necessarily, um, you know, we just want to maintain the accuracy, right? We want to maintain the accuracy, but we can get substantial benefit in interpretability if we optimize carefully. So I'm going to spend this talk discussing two uh, lines of research in my lab on very, very sparse predictive models for tabular data, and in particular, optimal decision trees and scoring systems. So let me start with um, decision trees here. So decision tree algorithms, they've been popular since the very beginning of machine learning. And the main problem that's always plagued decision tree algorithms is their lack of optimality because they've historically been greedy myopic algorithms that build the tree from the top down, um, like you know, Card and C4.5, those are two of the famous algorithms that do this. They just build the tree from the top down. And then they kind of greedily prune, them, prune, prune the trees back afterward. And the problem with the greedy algorithm is that if it chooses the wrong split at the top of the tree, there's actually no way to undo it because once you've made that split, you can't undo it. So um, these greedy algorithms produce suboptimal trees, but it's hard to improve over the greedy methods because decision tree optimization is really hard, you know, both theoretically and practically. There's a combinatorial explosion in the number of possible trees that we could consider. Um, and in particular, optimal sparse, trying to find an optimal sparse tree is NP hard and it's factorial, at least in the number of variables. So it's actually, it's actually a really difficult optimization problem. And you'd think that, you know, any hope of, of finding optimal sparse trees is kind of, you know, minimal. But it's actually, we've actually made a lot of advances in recent years. We can actually kind of do it. Okay, so the, the traditional methods, the greedy methods, um, for those, both the splitting and pruning conditions are based on statistical testing. So if you're trying to figure out what to split over here, you would run a bunch of statistical tests called splitting conditions to figure out which split to make at each part of the tree. And then for pruning, you would also, um, you would also grab some subtree in the tree, and, you know, random subtree, and then you do a hypothesis test and then decide that uh, yeah, you actually just want to reduce that part of the tree to a leaf. And so that's how these greedy methods work. Now, I'm just gonna give you a kind of very short history of decision tree optimization. Um, it started all the way back in the 60s and um, pro proceeded until you see some like famous characters here, CART and C4.5. And then it split into at least four different branches. The first one is um, ensemble methods that I won't talk about today because they're not interpretable. But the other methods, um, the other sort of branches are global tree optimization done with mathematical programming, starting with this kind of a very important paper, a very important line of papers by Kristen Bennett. And then these two branches are from the statisticians. Okay, so this branch is about different splitting criteria for different types of problems and handling statistical issues like bias and, and missing, missing values and so on. Whereas the fourth branch is on kind of more interesting problems like longitudinal data and survival curves. And there are people who are, you know, currently working on these areas now. And even back, um, you know, in these tutorials from, two, from even uh, 1998, even that tutorial had like hundreds and hundreds of papers on decision trees. People really like decision trees because, like I said, they're interpretable. Okay, so... Um, now, I just want to point out that the statisticians have noticed some issues that they ran into. Um, and in particular, they noticed that the trees sometimes choose irrelevant variables. And again, that's because they're doing greedy splitting and pruning. So if they chose an irrelevant variable, there's no way to get rid of it. Uh, also, they noticed that sometimes the trees were performing pretty poorly, um, maybe sometimes 10% worse than ensembles. They also can't tell how close to optimality their trees are, and they also have to derive new splitting criteria for every single objective that they actually want to optimize. So those are kind of bad. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that the global 
that this branch will actually solve the problems identified by the statisticians. Um, so I'm, what I'm hoping is that we can sort of say, okay, we can produce fully optimal decision trees and the user would pick the objective. Like the user would pick what they want to, um, you know, what, what they want to optimize. So maybe classification accuracy or balanced accuracy or area under the curve, whatever, you know, whatever they are interested in. And then um, we would regularize with sparsity for interpretability. So it would be a combination of whatever, like classification accuracy and the number of leaves in the tree. Okay, and I'm hoping that if we actually solve this problem, it would actually handle the statistician, the issues identified by the statisticians because you know, the trees wouldn't choose irrelevant variables because they're fully optimized and their performance wouldn't be necessarily 10% worse than ensembles. They would perform just as good as any other machine learning method. And then you'd be able to know exactly how close to optimality your trees were because they're fully optimal. And then, um, or at least there would be some bound uh, for optimality. And then you wouldn't need any splitting criteria at all because it's globally optimal. So you don't need splitting criteria. You don't need pruning criteria. It's all done. I'll let the window. You just identify the objective and you go. Okay, so I think this is the key to everything. And I think when we solve this, I think we could handle the other issues that the statisticians um, are concerned with, like the missing variables or, or various kinds of bias. And um, then from there, we could extend that work to other problems like survival curves or longitudinal data. And so far that hasn't happened yet, which is interesting. So it's an avenue for future, future research. Okay, so um, given that this is the key to everything, I'm gonna talk about the different approaches to solving this problem. Um, so sometimes people have been using genetic programming or neural networks. The problem with this is that there's no optimality gap and neural networks are really not great for this kind of problem anyway. It's a big space and so, you know, just and it's a discrete space. Neural networks don't really work that well for this problem. Um, for classification data that's actually able to be perfectly separated by a decision tree, SAT solvers have been very, very useful, like satisfiability solvers. The problem is that I don't know of any real data set where the data are able to be perfectly separated. And then the other two branches are mathematical programming solvers and dynamic programming or um, combined with branch and bound techniques. And the three most relevant methods right now are BINOCT, uh, DL8.5, and GHOST. And so I'm gonna talk about these three methods. Um, so BINOCT, is, again, it's mathematical programming, um, and DL8.5 is dynamic programming, and then GHOST is dynamic programming with bounds. Um, DL8.5 has fewer bounds than GHOST. GHOST is about three orders of magnitude faster than the other methods, and so I'm gonna be mostly, mostly talking about GHOST in this talk. Okay. So uh, let's consider the following objective, which is a combination of misclassification error and sparsity. And this constant C trades off between the two terms. So um, if this constant is like 0.01, that means you're willing to sacrifice 1% of, of accuracy in order to get one fewer leaf uh, in the tree. Because you, know, you, you want it to have that balance of sparsity and low misclassification error. Okay, so if you solve this problem to optimality, the solution is a tree. And so this is an example of an optimal tree on the Broward County, Florida rearrest data. So this is the solution to this optimization problem. Okay, so let's talk about how this dynamic programming with bounds works. So we start with the full data set and a naive label. So here we're putting all the data into one leaf it's a blue leaf, we're predicting blue. And um, yeah, that's, that's what it is. So now we're going to construct every possible tree of size one. So it's one split, okay? I, I know I've only drawn three of them. There's a lot more than three because I can have horizontal and vertical splits everywhere here, but I can only, I, my screen is only so big, so I drew three. So from there, um, we could keep doing this. We could continue and create all possible trees of size two, right? So take every split and then create another split below it. Okay, so I could keep doing this. And of course, I would end up enumerating this giant exponential search space, which is exactly what I want to avoid. Okay, so I'm not really gonna enumerate the whole search space. You'll see there's tricks to kind of keep it, keep it small. So the first trick is that you, you don't split when you don't need to. Like in this branch right here, it's a, it, it, in this leaf, it's a pure leaf. There's no yellow nodes here in this leaf. There's no yellow 
you know, there's no misclassified points in that leaf. So like, I don't want to split that leaf anymore. Okay, and then another trick that we use is to consolidate any duplication found. So for instance, the subproblem that we have to deal with here is the same as the subproblem here. And so if we actually collapse these in the, in the data structures that we're storing, then we don't have to solve it multiple times. We only solve that problem once and report the solution of that subproblem back to both of these cases, both this one and that one. Okay, so um, let me just enumerate the space. I'm gonna, I'm gonna enumerate the same space that I just did, except that I'm gonna enumerate it. Um, instead of going down, I'm going sort of outward uh, like that, okay? So uh, it, obviously, if I actually enumerated this whole thing, it would take, you know, it would fill up the whole universe essentially, but I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so if we solve the right, if we solve the subproblems, if we solve all the way down to the lowest level, we would get the, um, we would get the solution because we've enumerated every possible tree, we know what the best tree is, and then we could trace it back up um, and get the optimal solution. So there's the optimal decision tree right there, okay? So um, yeah, so the optimal solutions found after all subproblems are either completed or, or eliminated. And um, the elimination part is the key here because some subproblems can be proven to yield non-optimal solutions. So this is where the core, of our, uh, the core of our techniques really come into play because we have a whole bunch of theorems that actually reduce the search space very, very substantially. Okay, so these are, these are theorems and what they do is they literally chop off large chunks of the search space so that the remaining part of the search space is actually searchable in a reasonable period of time. So I'm going to show you some of these, uh, what the, the flavor of the theorems. I'm not going to actually write out the notation and stuff. I'm just going to tell you what the theorems do. Okay, so let's say that you're producing um, a tree. You're trying to cre create a tree. And um, you're thinking about putting a split on tornado right there. So this, is a, this tree is predi predicting whether I'm gonna get stuck in traffic on my way home from work, assuming I'll ever get to go to work again. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking about putting a split on, on tornado, right? So tornado would be a factor I would consider whether predicting that I was gonna get stuck in traffic. But the thing is that we don't get tornadoes that often. And so um, we can actually eliminate the possibility of splitting on tornado because there's not enough data that would go into that branch of the tree to, to make it worthwhile for us to do it. And um, in particular, we have a theorem that says that if the amount of data traveling through an internal node is less than 2C, where C again is the regularization parameter, then the tree probably can't achieve the minimum of the objective. And the reason for that is because if I eliminated that node, if I completely eliminated actually this whole chunk of the tree, then um, I would actually get a better objective, okay? So, and that's kind of an, an, an easy uh, theorem to implement as well. Um, so we just say, okay, fine. We, we just know that below this particular leaf, but below this particular branch, there's nowhere underneath here that we can split on tornado. It's not gonna happen. Okay, so another theorem we have is um, a theorem on accuracy. So it turns out, let's say we had enough data to split on tornado, but if we did that, then it turns out there's no way to make the tree accurate enough um, when we did it. And in that case, we can prove that we um, can never split on tornado. Okay, so if a proposed split would, would lead to less than C correctly classified data going to either side of the split, then the split can be excluded and we could exclude this feature tornado anywhere down, further down the tree extending that leaf. So that, yeah, that's another way to kind of reduce the size of the search space. Um, another theorem we have is called the one-step look-ahead bound. And this theorem has been very, very helpful and you know, it's, it's a very powerful theorem, even though it's so simple. So we actually keep track of a lower bound on our objective throughout the whole procedure, and it's called B. So I, I'm gonna say, let's consider a tree with a lower bound B that happens to be less than or equal to the current best solution that I've found so far. So the current best tree that I have so far has this objective R current best, okay? So if the lower bound B is below the current best, that means it's still in play, okay? Because the lower bound says, yeah, it could have a lower objective, so it's still in play. But if B plus the regularization parameter is greater than the current best, then we can prune all the child trees. There's no way this is going to, to, to be extended to form an optimal full tree. And the reason for that is because no matter what we add, if we add any more splits to the tree, 
um, we're out. We'll get a worse objective than the best one we found so far. Okay, so we have a lot of other tricks up our sleeves beside theorems. Um, we, we represent, the, the way we represent the tree in the computer actually really, really helps us. Um, so in particular, we represent each tree by its collection of leaves. Um, you see how I've written the tree like this, like a, like a tree with, you know, like that? So that's not how we represent the tree in memory. So the collection of leaves is rain construction and traffic, rain construction, no traffic, no rain, rush hour, construction and traffic, and so on and so forth. So now we can, we have actually a vector, right? And when we keep the tree stored this way, we can continue to split branches by constructing more elements in this, in this vector. And um, uh, we, we don't need to store how the tree was constructed from the top down, because we, we can always reconstitute the tree. So we, we just need to store the leaves. Okay, and then we actually store um, bounds and intermediate results within each of the, each of the leaves. Okay, so we also have what's called a permutation map. Now, if I see the same configuration of leaves, sorry, if I see the same leaves in a different permutation, right, then that is actually an isomorphic tree to the one I'm working on, right? It's the same tree, it's just that the leaves were listed in a different order. And so it's actually the same, you know, tree. So in that case, um, we would only need to work on one of these two uh, versions of this tree and not both of them. Okay, so we have this data structure and it keeps track of all the trees we've seen so far. So that every time we see a tree that we think might be a new tree, we go look it up in the permutation map and we say, did we see this tree before? If we did, okay, we're done with this. If we didn't see it before, we put it, we create a new entry in the permutation map for the new tree. Okay, so the next, th the next trick is to use bit vectors to describe the data represent that is that is captured by each leaf that's represented by each leaf. So, for instance, data point one in the data set. Um, so this is the first time that I, you know, drove home from work. Um, it actually was a day when there was rain in construction and traffic was predicted. So that's the first bit there, and then the second and third data points were in the second leaf, and then. The fourth data point was in the, this leaf and so on. So we actually have the, this bit vector for each leaf to just keep track of the data that are captured by, by that leaf. And this is actually a very handy way to operate with data because every time you see a new tree, right, it's an extension of a previous tree that you've worked with before. And so you don't need to regenerate which data are captured by which leaf every time. You can just you know, do incremental computation and carry the information to the next um, to the next leaf. Okay, so um, here the if we're trying to compute the objective again, right? Because we have to compute the objective for every tree that we come across. But if we've already computed the objective for the you know if we've already computed the part of the objective for this leaf, well we know which points are captured by that leaf. We can carry them down to the leaves that we're thinking about creating below it. And also the bounds that we created for each leaf we carry the information of the bound um, below it as well to help us calculate things. So it's actually very handy to, to store all the data like this and store all the leaves like this. Okay, so the, this combination of these theorems that reduce the size of the search space, the leaf-based representation, the permutation map to reduce extra computation, the caching of intermediate results, the incremental computation, and then the consolidation of repeated subproblems leads to a very, very fast implementation to the point where it's actually possible to solve these problems to provable optimality for reasonably sized data sets in a reasonable period of time. So just to give you a little bit more information about Ghost in particular, um, Ghost actually is very general. It actually works on um, any loss function you like that is monotonically increasing in the number of false positives and false negatives, right? So any reasonable loss function would be, like it would be super weird if like the number of false positives went up and the loss goes down, like that wouldn't make any sense. So you can actually program in your own custom loss um, as long as it's monotonically increasing in false positives and false negatives. Uh, and this will, you know, it'll run. Um, and, uh, uh, if there, it also works on rank statistics. So rank statistics are things like the area under the RSE curve, 
and the partial area under the RSE curve, like if you just care about like the top of the ranked list, trying to make that real accurate. Um, it actually works on that too, although for the rank statistics, we lose a bunch of the theorems that make it go really, really fast. So the rank statistics do run a bit slower. Now, um, I just want to show you that when you, when you do alter the objective, you actually get different trees. So I'm just showing you results on the Florida rearrest data over here. Um, so if you optimize for accuracy, you'd get one tree, but if you opt optimize for balanced accuracy, um, you might get a slightly different tree. And if you optimize for area, the convex hull under the um, RFC curve, then um, you would get even, even maybe a slightly different tree, okay? Because they're optimizing different objectives. But again, there's no splitting criteria. There's no pruning criteria. It's fully opt globally optimal. Okay. Um, so I, I didn't feel like putting up a whole bunch of experimental results slides. I want to try to minimize that. So I just want to summarize for you what we found. And none of this really should be surprising based on what I've just presented. Um, the main experimental results is that we get very similar classification error to the black box methods for this kind of tabular data. So we're not losing any accuracy over the black box machine learning methods. Um, however, if you're going to program in your own custom loss, like if you want to do balanced accuracy or some kind of, you know, some other interesting accuracy score, then we're much better than the greedy decision tree methods like Cardin C 4.5 because those methods, their splitting criteria is designed for accuracy. And it's, it doesn't really work that well on the custom objectives. Whereas we don't, again, we don't need to worry about the splitting criteria so we can fully, fully optimize. And particularly for imbalanced data, like if you're going to do some kind of weighted accuracy, CART and, CART and C 4.5 just don't work that well for imbalanced problems. Um, they really don't. And so um, that's where these methods really shine. Uh, the trees that we're producing are sparser than all of the heuristic methods because, again, the heuristic methods, if they keep splitting, there's no way to undo the bad split. Um, so they spend the rest of the tree kind of undoing the mistake at the top. So um, because we're not doing those greedy methods, we're getting, we're getting trees that are sparser than the heuristic methods. And um, I guess the really nice experimental result that might uh, that, that I'm really proud of is the fact that we're orders of magnitude faster than the next best method for solving these kinds of problems. So I will put up one ex that experimental result just to show you um, the scalability of this. So here, these are results on the FICO data set, which was used for the explainable machine learning challenge in 2018. So this, what I'm showing you here is a whole bunch of different machine learning methods. So CART, which again, CART is very scalable, but it's not optimal. And then these are the methods that we're in competition with. So DL 8.5, which is again, dynamic programming, GHOST, which is our method. And then oh, this is our method from last year, optimal sparse decision trees. And then this is the Python version of GHOST. We actually have everything in C++ um, with a Python interface, um, whereas the PyGhost is are fully in Python. So you can kind of see the difference that um, just working in, uh, working in different language uh, makes here. And um, you'll notice that binoct is not here. And the reason is because it was too slow to include. We just couldn't do all the experiments with binoct. It was too slow. And so uh, what I'm showing you here is um, number of features versus time. And again, th these problems, they, they scale very poorly with the number of features because that's where the exponential increase in the complexity of the problem is. So these results, this is why we're very proud of it. Because if you use even a very good method like DL 8.5, um, it just, the time blows up. It's just really slow. You know, it's just really slow after a few features. Um, this is PyGhost. So this is, again, the Python version of, of us. And then this is la our last year's attempt. Um, and then the blue one is um, uh, our method this year. So this is Ghost. And then a cart is over here. So again, cart is very, very scalable. It's just not, not optimal. Okay, so I got a couple of questions here. Um, how's the performance compared to conditional inference trees? I have no idea what conditional inference trees are, but unless they're actually producing optimal solutions uh, to a particular uh, optimization problem with a provable guarantee of optimality, I probably might not have actually heard of them. Okay. Um, okay, and then this person asks, why well, I didn't get why credit score went down after paying off a loan. So I think that's because there's something wrong with the credit scoring models. I mean, the only reason I found out that credit scores go, um, go 
down after paying off a loan is because I paid off a loan and my credit score went down and I was like, what the heck is going on? And then I went and looked it up. So it was, <laughs> that's, what, <laughs> that's what happened. And, and then I looked it up and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a thing, like it happens. And I thought, oh yeah, these credit scoring, scoring models are messed up. If they were actually understandable, um, they might've been able to fix problems like that. Okay. So, um, all right, so let's go back to the experiments. Um, yeah, so our improvements are essentially orders of magnitude better than other methods. And so we're, we're very pleased at the state we're in, but we still have a lot, a lot of work to do. Okay, this is a very similar set of experimental results on a different data set. This is the Florida Compass data set that I was telling you about. And again, you're getting a very, very similar pattern across data sets. CART, scalable but not optimal. DL8.5, much slower. Um, this is the Python version, last year's attempt, and then this year's attempt here, which goes up. There's a little guy right there. That's where it goes up. Okay. So I want to switch over to talking about um, scoring systems, which is the, the other kind of major portion of the talk. And um, scoring systems, like, so optimal decision trees and optimal scoring systems, these problems have kind of been in existence for really, really, you know, these are historically very important, very old problems. Um, so scoring systems have been around since at least, you know, the 1920s. Like this is a, this is just a, a snapshot of a, a part of a scoring system that's used, it's called a Burgess model. It was a point score, like you add up, you add up factors and then those, pa those factors, um, uh, you know, you get a number of points for them and then the number of points translates into your percent of violating, percent risk of violating parole. And they grouped people into different categories and then um, actually calculated the violation rate for each category. And the categories were so funny. Um, like you could be a ne'er-do-well or a mean citizen or a recent immigrant. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so nowadays our, our scoring, our uh, categories for individuals is very different than it was in 1928. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of a more modern scoring system that's used in the criminal justice system. This is the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing Score, and they have points, and those points get added up, and they translate into a risk of arrest in a following period of time. And you see all the points, the, the points are small, and they're integer valued. Here's another one. This is the violence risk appraisal guide. There are actually whole studies on comparing all of these scoring systems to each other for different, you know, different criminal justice problems. Uh, and they've actually, the scoring systems in criminal justice have been actually found to reduce inequity because you at least have some statistics to work from rather than having a judge just sort of like staring at the person and then making up a, a risk assessment. Okay, so uh, also there are huge numbers of scoring systems used in medicine. You can go to websites like Medscape and then click around uh, and go to a different, uh, special, go to whatever specialty you like. If you go to seizure, you could click on the two helps to be score. And then you can put in, you know, you could click on, you, know, and you answer the, these questions and then it gives you a risk of, it gives you a risk of seizure within the next six hours. Okay, so, so hundreds of these point scores in medicine. Now the key challenges in constructing these models are the constraints, because doctors might want to have, for instance, you know, certain constraints on fairness or false positive rate or you know whatever they want to have constraint for, and also the fact that the point scores have to be small integer coefficients. And um, for us mathematicians, we, you know, we we usually say like oh, we don't care why they're why it's integers; it doesn't make sense to us, but it actually really does make sense to have it be integers because it helps people really understand kind of counterfactual reasoning. You say, oh, I got two points for this, one point for that, three points for this. Well, that means, you know, if I was five, if I'm five years older and I have the same score, this is what it would be. And it's really easy to do these kind of calculations in your head. It's also easier for doctors to explain to patients um, why the score is what it is and so forth. So these, and, and people go to big, like huge lengths to, to make sure that these point scores are integers. They round and they do all sorts of stuff to make sure that that happens. Okay, so um, the typical approach that people would use, there's a couple typical approaches. One is to get a bunch of doctors into a room and have them create the score. And that actually works. Um, the CHADS2 score, which is the most 
widely used predictive model in medicine, arguably. That model was produced by doctors, a panel of experts, okay? And it was validated afterward on data. And then the other leading approach for doing this is to do preliminary feature selection followed by logistic regression on the coefficients that are left, um, and then scaling and rounding. The problem with this is that it just is like a bunch of hacks. It's like, like how do you do the scaling? And how do I, you know, what exactly, how do I do the feature selection? It's, you know, it's just basically leaving this hard optimization problem up to the doctors, which I don't think we should really have to do. Like the doctors, why should they have to solve this optimization problem? That's really up to us. And here's, here's why it's not a good idea to do um, scaling and rounding. It's, it's the same reason that we do integer programming for any application. It's because um, rounding doesn't always give you a solution that is any good. Okay, so let's say that, you're, that, that you, do logistic, you do logistic regression. These are, the, these are the level sets of logistic loss. And then you, let's say you go round. Okay, fine, you go round, you get those four points. Well, see, when you rounded, you went against the performance gradient. And in fact, there was a solution over here that was quite good, but you didn't see it because you had only rounded. Um, and the rounding can really get you into trouble with high dimensional data. So for instance, let's say that we ran, um, so this is, we're, we're working on the same problem as the two helps to B score. So here we're trying to predict seizures within six hours. This is for brain trauma patients based on um, continuous EEG uh, readings, okay? And so let's say we run elastic net which is a, a classical statistic, statistical technique. And then let's say we do rounding, okay? So we do rounding. So what happens is that all the small coefficients go to zero. So we've wiped out that whole part of the signal. That's clearly not a good idea. Okay, so what we could do is, um, let's go back to the original solution. Let's try scaling and rounding. So I multiply all the coefficients by something and then I round. But then when I did that, it just gave me some sort of garbage and that's not really what I wanted. And so it basically leaves you grappling. You're like, okay, maybe I should omit this feature and then do logistic regression, do round. Like it just leaves you in this pit of doom, essentially, if you're optimization doom, if you're the doctor trying to, to do this. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna show you on the next slide is a solution to this problem that is fully optimized uh, for sparsity and, uh, and the quality of the solution. Um, it's actually incredibly sparse and it uses the same data set I showed you on the previous few slides. And this is the point scores here. It's only, you know, a couple of features, two points for this, two points for this, one point for that, one point for this. And then the score translates into the risk of seizure within the next six hours. So that one's better and it has um, a nice large AUC. Okay, so let me tell you the method by which we created that scoring system. Um, it's called risk slim or risk calibrated super sparse linear integer models. So there are two terms again, there's a accuracy term, which is the logistic loss, which helps keep the model accurate and also calibrated. It keeps the risks calibrated. Logistic loss is known to be good for that particular thing. A calibrated means that the probability of predicted seizure is, should be similar to the, probability, to, to the probability of true seizure. And then this is a model size term. This is just the number of non-zero terms in the model there, uh, multiplied by a constant, which the user gets to control. And then this constraint lambda in L, that means that the coefficients are between negative 10 and 10 and they are integers. So um, that's, that's the main problem. And then if the doctor wants to add additional constraints like fairness constraints or whatever they want, um, then they can add those constraints as well. Now, if you're a, an optimization expert and you're staring at this problem, you'll probably realize that this is actually really, really hard. It's a mixed integer nonlinear program because its feasible region is the integer lattice. Um, so, yuck. I mean, if you sent this problem into like a MinLP solver, even for a small data set, you'd be there until the end of the universe. It wouldn't solve. So um, we, we uh, tried then to do, use cutting planes and our uh, uh, standard cutting plane techniques, and those didn't work. And so we ended up developing our own cutting plane technique, but the risk slim method does. So in order to explain to you, oh, what is model size? Model size is the number of non-zero terms in the model. So this model size is four. And this model size is one, two, three, four, five, five. Okay. So um, yeah. Oh, and then I have another question. Why not just multiply by a thousand? So precision is preserved and still an integer is used. We need small integers because humans 
can't really reason with numbers that are like 572,412. It's really hard to add those and subtract those and do counterfactual reasoning kind of in your head with these big, um, big integers. In that case, we might as well use decimals, right? We might as well preserve the decimals. Okay, so um, I want to give you just a, a, a little introduction to cutting planes for those of you who, um, who don't know what that is. So, um, and, and I'll show you why it doesn't work in our case. All right, so with cutting planes, so let's, let's just consider the logistic loss here. So the logistic loss is convex. So that's what this gray thing is supposed to represent, right? The logistic loss. And um, on this axis, these are, this is the model, these are the models, this is the coefficients. And I, I can only draw one axis, but here I have, a, there's an, a, an axis for every possible coefficient. Um, and I'm trying to minimize the logistic loss subject to the constraints that, you know, I have to have integer solutions. Okay, so the cutting plane methods iteratively construct this surrogate underneath the logistic loss. Okay, so at, at every iteration, you would add another, um, you know, another piece of this uh, uh, approximation here, this under approximation. So then what you'd, what you'd do at every iteration is you'd solve, the, you'd solve the linear program to minimize this blue thing, the cutting plane approximation. And normally you'd be very happy to do that. And then what you do at that point is you evaluate the objective there and add another cut. You'd add another like blue line there and continue doing this over and over again until the, um, until the objective value and the blue cutting plane approximation were, were equal to each other at the next iteration. But um, for our problem, it doesn't work that well. Um, in fact, it fails really badly because when you went to go solve the linear program, you landed on a point that wasn't an integer, right? This is 5.5. And so we know that that's not an integer and we know the solutions have to be integers. It, this is not a feasible solution. So um, what we, what we um, could do uh, at every iteration, if we're using a standard cutting plane method, we would try to solve a mixed integer program. Like we could find this point or this point, right? But then what happens is you're solving larger and larger mixed integer programs at every iteration and that takes forever and at some point the thing will stall and it'll be terrible. So we designed this, this technique that um, what it does is it does some kind of branch and bound in the middle of this cutting plane um, approximation where um, it takes the solution that we have, which landed on 5.5 there, and it said, okay, you're not allowed to produce a solution with, um, we'd actually split it into two problems. It says, the first problem says, you, you're not allowed to have this coefficient be more than five. And the other problem says, you're not allowed to have this coefficient be, um, um, be less than, um, be, um, sorry, this coefficient has to be more than six. Right, so for this problem, it says, okay, we're putting a linear constraint, has to be less than five. This problem says has to be greater than six. Okay, so now we have two subproblems that we need to solve, but we still have linear, it's still just, the, just having the solution for that coefficient be less than five and that coefficient be greater than six, that's just linear, these are linear constraints. Okay, so now we have two subproblems, but still linear constraints. Okay, now if we happen to solve a subproblem, um, like, for instance, if we solve this subproblem and it lead, led to a feasible integer solution, like that solution right there, then we can add a cutting plane. We can add a cutting plane right there. And if not, then we continue to split into more, more and more subproblems. But each of them require only a linear program. And linear programs we know are much, much easier to solve than you know, almost anything else. Okay, and um, if we happen to find that the subproblem solution equals the objective, then we've actually solved the whole problem and we're done. So um, let me show you how it works in practice because it's, it's, it's implemented in Cplex with callbacks. So every iteration of this, remember you solve a linear program because you have to minimize this cutting plane approximation. Um, and then at, if, again, you, you just check one of these two things. If the subproblem leads to a feasible solution, create a cut, Otherwise, you split into these two subproblems. So it's all done with callbacks and CPLEX. And um, it's the only method that generates solutions within a reasonable period of time. Because like I said, the minimal P solvers don't work 
and the standard cutting planes requires solving larger and larger mixed integer programs. Now, another thing that we did uh, when we were working on this is that we realized that like warm starting and like doing heuristics to try to improve the solution was actually really helpful in improving the running time. So we developed some kind of sophisticated rounding techniques that you can use kind of anytime you, you want to. You can use it at the very beginning, or you can use it in the middle of the technique, um, or you can use it you know, whenever, whenever you want. Um, using this obviously won't give you a guarantee on the optimality of the solution. For that, you need to run the full algorithm, but um, this will at least give you a better solution than the one you had before. Okay, so these are two different rounding techniques, and one is called sequential rounding, and the other is discrete coordinate descent. Okay, so let's say you have some set of coefficients. So these are your point scores. So your point scores are 1, 2, 1, uh-oh, 5.5, 6.3, 5, blah, blah, blah. So what you do is, Okay, instead of rounding all the coefficients to integers, you check, out each co you check out each coefficient that's not an integer, and then you round it both up and down, and then you figure out uh, what, what, what causes the least amount of harm to the objective. Okay, so let's say that it happened that moving 3.8 to 4 didn't do very much harm to the objective. And then you tried 5.5, so you could round it either up or down, and here we decided to round it down because again, that was the least harm done to the objective out of all possibilities here. And then and we'll keep rounding until everything is an integer. And then at that point, we switch to discrete coordinate descent. So in discrete coordinate descent, you update one coefficient at a time. You, um, for instance, let's say you're updating, uh, let's say you're updating this one here you'd look through all possibilities for, for you know, what we could replace that one with that's an integer, small integer, that would give us a better solution. And so here, replacing the one with a two gave us a good solution. And replacing the one, this one with a four gave us a better solution, and so on. And, and we keep doing this until our solution is what's called one-opt, which means there's no way to improve the solution by adjusting any one of these coefficients um, to be another value, okay? So it's, it's a local optimal solution. It's one opt, so it's one optimal. Okay, so let me show you an application for our uh, work, which is preventing brain damage in critically ill patients. Um, and so we, we actually developed the two helps to B score that's used in Medscape. Um, this is work done with uh, physicians at Massachusetts General Hospital and the University of Wisconsin. And they're interested in, um, they're, they're helping patients with with brain trauma. So for instance, let's say that the patient comes into the hospital with a brain aneurysm that bursts and they have blood in their brain. Um, so they would get a scan and then they would get surgery. Then they would be hooked up to continuous EEG monitors, which would measure their brain signals. And uh, to be, and it's, the EEG monitors are trying to warn the doctor, and the monitors are useful for warning the doctors about seizures. Now seizures, these are brain seizures. These, these are seizures only in your brain. It's not like a patient shaking or anything. It's not like a, like a seizure, what you think of as a seizure. This is just your just the brain. And these seizures are really dangerous. Um, in fact, 20% of the patients get these seizures. Uh, these are, these, again, these are patients in the intensive care units of hospitals. So they're actually really quite ill. And um, these seizures actually lead to brain damage and death. And so the doctors really do everything they can to predict uh, seizures so that they can do something about them to the point where they might even, if the patient continues to seize, they might give the patient medication to actually turn off the patient's brain somewhat to, to prevent the patient from getting seizures. So anyway, um, these, this is a very, uh, very important problem that the doctors are trying to solve and they need to use EEG data, continuous EEG, EEG data to, um, to predict the seizures and determine duration of monitoring. Now, the duration of monitoring is really important because the patients tend to be put on the monitors for way too long, which deprives other patients of monitors who might actually need them. And the doctors don't know whether the patients need them until they put them on the monitors. So it's, it's really, and, and the monitoring is limited. Like there's only a limited number of monitors and doctors who can monitor, who can sort of uh, read those monitors. Okay, so we have to allocate the monitors very carefully. And um, that's why we need to be able to predict seizures well, because if we don't think the patient's gonna, patient's gonna have a seizure, then we can reallocate the monitor to someone who might need it. Okay, so we designed the two helps to B score with data from um, 
a, a large cohort of, of patients from several different hospitals. This is the EEG Monitoring Research Consortium that provided these data, um, and my collaborator runs that consortium. And, um, and we worked with him to develop this score. So it's two helps to be because it's two H E L P S and then two points for the B. And then when you get the, so the doctors can, they can just, they know what the model is just by knowing its name. And then when you get the point score, it translates into a risk of seizure within the next six hours. Now two helps to be, um, I know it, again, it looks like a rule of thumb, but it was not created by doctors. It was created from data going into an algorithm. It's a full blown machine learning model. It's just as accurate as any black box we can apply to this data. Um, and doctors can decide themselves whether to trust it. It's not like a black box machine learning model where um, you, know, you, you have to sort of trust it because you can't see into it. Here, the doctors can decide whether they wanna trust it. Um, they can also calibrate the score with information not in the database. So if the patient is exhibiting something that the doctor wants to you know, add into the score, they can go ahead and do that. And the score can be explained to non-physicians. So you can explain to someone why their relative is being taken off EEG monitoring or you know, whatever. Now, um, I've only presented like six factors here, but we started with a group of factors that was larger than 70. We had a, quite a large number of EEG uh, factors that, that um, risk slim chose from. So now when the patient comes in with their burst aneurysm and they get their seizure, sorry, they get their surgery, and then they're being monitored for seizures in the EEG, then the doctor would look at their EEG um, signal and say, okay, this patient um, has a two helps to be score of three. That means they're high risk, and we need to place them on continuous EEG monitoring for over 72 hours, at least 72 hours, and then place them on preventative medications so that they won't get a seizure. Now, um, the doctors that I work with, they actually con conducted a validation study that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't part of the study. I, I was really thrilled to see that this actually worked out, um, where they took data from an independent cohort of patients from, another, from other hospitals. And what they found was that the results, the quality of predictions held up nicely. So this is the predicted probability of seizure, and this is the true probability of seizure. So if you're on the diagonal, you're good. And what you'll see here is that the two helps to be scores, like you can get up to a score of, you know, greater than four on two helps to be. And so it's actually distributed nicely along this predicted probability curve, um, which is great because it actually gives you like the, you know, it's, it's not like the points are all bunched into the corner like you might have if you tried to do rounding and whatever. It's actually nicely spread out. And that's because of the logistic loss, um, because of the optimization that we did that allowed that to happen. And um, the blue is the initial study, and then the green is the validation study they did. So it, it's holding up nicely across hospitals. Um, and it's been implemented in um, the two hospitals of the, you know, of my collaborators, um, University of Wisconsin and MGH, and then ongoing implementation in a lot of other hospitals. Um, but as part of the validation study, the doctors estimated that it resulted in a huge duration of monitoring per patient. So 63.6% .6 reduction in duration. So they could reallocate the monitors, which led to um, a huge number of patients, more patients being monitored than before, 2.82 times more patients than before. And it, it saved a little bit of money, but the, the thing that the doctors really care about is this statistic here, the fact that we're able to monitor a lot more patients. Okay, so, um, I think just before I finish, I just want to point out that um, that you know I'm just going to switch over and tell you that uh, that you know it's not like interpretable models can only be created for, for tabular data. We can actually create interpretable models even for neural networks. Um, although it's much more difficult to figure out what interpretability actually means for this type of data. So we were thinking, well, could you create a, an interpretable neural network? And so we did. We actually created a model that uses case-based reasoning where it's the network tries to explain to me like, okay, why is this bird classified as a clay colored sparrow? And the network says, well, it's because this part of the bird looks like this part of that bird. And this is a prototypical clay colored sparrow. And then there's some points involved in, in that classification. And then, um, you know, oh, I think, well, this part of this, this part of the bird looks like this part of that bird. And that's a prototypical clay colored sparrow. And then because of all these comparisons that the network is making, 
um, you know, the network is that it's saying that's how I'm reasoning about this image. I'm looking at the different parts of the image and I'm giving points to each of these comparisons and adding up the points and that's how I'm doing the classification. And so, um, yeah, we wrote a paper about this and what, what we found was that the accuracy of this neural network um, was approximately the same as the black box baselines that have been published in the, in the literature. Um, so even for computer vision, it's still possible to design an interpretable model of the same accuracy as a black box. Um, we're still trying, we're still working on this. We're trying to apply it to mammography, but it's actually very, very difficult because there's a lot of problems with confounding in mammography. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the model tends to do comparisons with normal tissue very often. And so you know that like the reasoning process of the network is wrong. Uh, and the fact that we have to sort of force our explanations to be good, in addition to forcing like the, the accuracy of the model to be good, um, it, it's much harder, right? It's much harder to train, but it makes sure that the algorithm is actually reasoning about things correctly. And we know right now that it's not doing that. And so that's actually helpful for us for troubleshooting. Okay, so just to summarize, um, I presented work on decision trees. Our modern decision tree methods are not your old cart. <laughs> um, I presented work on scoring systems that are an alternative to rounding methods, uh, which can go against the performance gradients. And then interpretable networks, yes, they do exist. <laughs> and uh, there's some links to some of the papers that I talked about today. And, um, and thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot, Cynthia, for the, for the great talk. Um, uh, and thanks for those who are sticking around. Uh, what we'll do is, if you have questions, I, I saw there was uh, a few questions coming into the in the in the Q and A. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps Cynthia, you, you you want to answer those uh, those first? Sure. Yeah, I'll answer those. Um, can Ghost be extended to time scale data in some way? So as I mentioned, it hasn't been extended to time series data yet, and that's um, an avenue for future work that um, I think is important, but we haven't worked on that. Okay. Uh, the risk sum solution is beautiful, but two questions come to mind. How is it actually regularized? Um, L0 does not penalize weight magnitude, which seems critical to me to prevent overfitting. Um, so the, weight, the weights are restricted to be between negative 10 and 10. So the weight magnitude cannot be more than 10 anyway. So um, perhaps that actually, add, I mean, the fact that we're using integers actually adds regularization anyway, but the fact that we have no more than 10 for those values also uh, adds regularization to. Yeah, is the limited coefficient range in integer restriction enough? Yes, we, we haven't found any problem with overfitting on these risk slow models because they're so heavily regularized. Okay, logistic loss and hinge loss SBM often produce similar performance in practice. Yes, they do. In fact, all machine learning methods perform similarly in practice <laughs> for, for tabular data. Could you have gotten around the nonlinearity of logistic loss by using hinge loss? In other words, you'd get an MILP instead of a MinLP to start with. You could, you could, but then we'd have a little trouble with the calibration. Um, oh yeah, or was the calibration of logistic, logistic loss absolutely critical to the selection of this loss? Calibration was one of the criteria for performance. And so we really, really wanted the, uh, the calibration to be good. But I think you have a really good point, which is that um, we could try running, SP we could try to put SVM in there and make the optimization problem easier recalibrate afterward, and that actually might lead to a good solution too. And we probably should have tried that, but we didn't think of it. So thank you very much. Um, okay, can we think of using a, whoops, um, a meta heuristic method in the last step? Meta heuristic method. Questions, would the algorithm get stuck in a suboptimal solution? A meta heuristic, you mean like the rounding methods, I guess you're talking about? Um, yeah, I think this is this is related to the heuristics you talked about. I don't know if the question came in before you talked about the discrete coordinate descent and the uh, and the and the rounding. But yeah, so, I would I would imagine the answer is yes, right? You help do some polishing, which is what you end up doing with these with these heuristics. Yeah, exactly. The heuristics help you polish, but you wouldn't get a guarantee of optimality unless you actually stuck the heuristic in and got the lower bound and make sure the optimality gap is zero. But yes, we can. Um, a simple scoring system can lead to a risk percent, but do the physicians know what the right course of action is given a risk percent? Yes, and I totally skipped that because it wasn't part of the talk, <laughs> but you're right, <laughs> you can. Um, so the scoring system should ultimately lead to a recommendation action, yes, and the optimality should be validated from data. 
So the physicians actually had, um, they actually uh, used survival analysis to figure out what to do with the patients based on the two helps to be score. So they actually would look at like two patients who had two helps to be score of three and look at how the two helps to be score decayed over time based on the medications and based on, you know, leaving the patient alone. So, you know, if you had a two helps to be score of one, this is what would happen over time. And so at this point, the risk is low enough that we, that we can take them off the, the monitors. So you are absolutely right about, about that. And um, sorry, I wasn't able to, to talk about that, but yeah, that absolutely should be included. Okay, how do you interpret the model from raw EEG data? Okay, so the, the doctors interpret the, the raw EEG data. The doctors just look at the EEG and they actually look and say, okay, this is, what, this is what's in the EEG signal. Um, the EEG signals are, are kind of, are not that easy to read. An expert can read it really nicely, and actually, my collaborator, Brandon Westover, he's actually building um, a neural network that, that uh, actually tries to interpret the raw EG data, but um, it isn't that accurate. And so um, they're, you know, they're, they're actively troubleshooting it, trying to figure out how to, um, how to deal with it. Um, the data we have is from, you know, it's from doctors. It's actually doctors that correctly labeled all the pieces of the EEG. Um, so we had a very nicely curated uh, data set. Um, but right now we're actually working with the raw EEG and we're trying to do some sort of decision making stuff like what the what the previous person asked. Um, did it reduce mortality? That's very, very difficult to measure because you don't know it it's really it's really hard to measure because if you took an action based on two helps to be, then um, it, yeah, so mortality, like I said, it they were able to they were able to measure, because see, the problem is that if you're using the help to helps to be score to figure out who to monitor, you don't know whether the people who weren't monitored um, would have had the would have had the seizures anyway. So doing that doing that causal inference problem was very very difficult. But it was much easier to measure like the number of patients who got more monitoring. So that's what they measured. Like some of these problems, like that that you're talking about. How do you measure this? How do you evaluate that? Some of those problems are actually more difficult than the problem we actually solved. Um, and we ran into this problem with like, you know, I do a lot of, I d used to do a lot of work on power grid maintenance and people were asking, did it help, did it help? And I'm like, evaluating whether it helped is harder than actually solving the problem. Um, so we always use kind of proxies that are sort of indicative of the quality of care that the patients are getting, even if we can't measure um, things like mortality. Does ghost work on survival trees? No, it doesn't work on survival trees. I wish it did, but, um, it doesn't, it, it's not, it's not extend, it hasn't been extended yet to survival trees. It's, um, you know, it's 2020 work and so it's brand new and uh, yeah, I wish we had time to do that, but if you would like to do it, you're welcome to. Um, how sensitive are the interpretable models to the data? For example, if we take a subset of the data and build these interpretable models, could we end up getting a completely different model? Yeah, you could. Um, and in fact, there's no reason why the solutions of these optimization problems need to be unique. Like you could have a set of a hundred different scoring systems that are all totally different from each other and use different features, but they're equally accurate with or equally, you know, have an equal value of the, the optimal um, objective. Um, you know, you could also, you could have hundreds of decision trees that are equally sparse and equally accurate that's totally possible. And um, there's no reason why there would be only a single solution to the problem, especially if you have correlated features. Like if you have a bunch of features that are very similar to each other, it could use any combination of those features to form, you know, that part of the tree. So um, yeah, there's no reason why, why these models need to be uh, unique. And some people say, oh, it's a weakness. It's a weakness that they're not unique. But the fact is that linear models have exactly the same problem. If you have two features that are very similar to each other, when you run at like lasso, logistic regression, anything you want, they, there can be multiple solutions with almost the same objective value that are totally different from each other. And so that's, you know, that's true of every statistical technique that I know of, that solutions aren't necessarily unique. Uh, so maybe or, as, a, as, a follow, as a follow up to that, um, it, typically, if you're doing just optimization, not for machine learning, um, <clears throat> having 
in most cases, it might not matter that you have multiple optimal solutions because you're just going to take the recommended solution, execute it in the real world, and you, you know you have a guarantee that they all equivalent according to the objective function you defined. Uh, but if you're, doing, if you're doing, say, supervised learning, um, then I can think you know, immediately that, one, you have the generalization concern, two, you have the interpretability concern. And so if, you know, there, although you can't, you can't measure the differences, I guess one aspect is because your objective is split into, you know, loss, empirical loss and, um, and uh, regularization, mm -hmm. that's, that's, one, that's one thing one can look at, right? Solutions can be uh, equal in the total objective, but have different values, and then you can pick between, between the ones you prefer. Um, but I wonder whether there, there might be other considerations that one can think about. You know, if there's a thousand equivalent decision trees with the same, roughly same level of sparsity and same level of um, training laws, then, then what does that mean? So there usually are other considerations that domain experts are interested in, but they almost never realize them right at the beginning. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what we usually did, like for example, when we when we work with Brandon um, and Aaron on this um, on this to, on the two helps to be score, we just brought them like a like a whole printed out mm -hmm. booklet of different mm -hmm. models, and we told them, look at these things, tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like, mm -hmm. and then whatever they you know whatever they didn't like, there's usually a reason they didn't like it, and then you add that in as an extra constraint. Mm -hmm. And so then you kind of narrow it down to get what you want. Or sometimes if you have, you know, two models and one just makes more sense than the other one, um, just intuitively to the, to the doctor, they can choose that one. So it's actually really handy to have um, multiple optimal solutions. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I guess then that's, that's similar to the typical OR setting in which uh, you might end up with hidden constraints, basically, that uh, you know, the optimizer takes to the end user and then the end user says, oh, yeah, actually, I don't like this schedule or this whatever. Uh, I, I like the other solution better. That makes sense. Exactly. Um, okay, uh, Laura, are you here? Uh, I guess uh, we can we can move on to student questions if there are, aren't any other questions from the from the wider audience. Yes, definitely. So I, I've posted it in the chat, but if there are okay. any other questions at this moment, feel free to ask them to Professor Rudin while you have the opportunity. <laughs> well, the questions that I got earlier were excellent. I mean, really, really excellent. This audience is just, yeah, these guys really know what they're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, Zoom webinar is a bit non-interactive uh, in that way that, you know, but I guess that's also convenient to aggregate questions. Um, but we didn't get to kind of talk to, to those who ask the, the interesting questions. Um, yeah. Okay, so I guess, I guess since there aren't any, any questions uh, at the moment from the wider audience in the Q&A box, then, uh, Laura, should, should we perhaps ask only the students who are interested in asking questions to stay, or how are we going to do this? Yeah, so if uh, there are any other students, I guess, that would be interested to stay and ask any questions right now. Um, this is a period specifically designed just for students to ask their questions. So um, I'm not sure how many of the questions that were asked were student versus faculty or alumni. I uh, don't think we have quite a criteria to realize that. but. Um, yeah, we can leave the floor open for a little bit longer. Um, and if not, we can wrap up a little bit early. I should mention that the lead uh, one of the two lead authors on the ghost paper is a student at Toronto. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Jimmy Lin. Okay, yeah, I, wonder, I wonder if uh, Jimmy's on here. Okay, I guess not. But are, are they doing their PhD or? No, he's actually doing a master's degree. Oh, okay. Let's see. Cool. Small work. Yeah. We tried to convince him to come to Duke, but <laughs> you, guys, you guys got him. That's good. Yeah. It's a competitive sport. <laughs> Okay, I, I guess uh, 
I don't know if we're mostly left with students or not. Um, so maybe I, I have some questions. So I'll, I'll use my privilege uh, as a co-panelist. Uh, okay, I'm getting a call from Jamaica for some reason. Um, so, uh, so, so my question is about, is about the scalability, uh, uh, scalability question, uh, particularly in the, in the Optima 3 um, uh, part of the talk. Um, so you had these plots with a number of features, um, and, and I guess you were, uh, on the real data, you were essentially limiting, uh, so how were you, how, how were you restricting the, the columns of the data set to be able to, to test scalability as a function of, uh, of so that? We're adding, we're adding more and more splits in these continuous uh, features. So you, so... I see, okay, okay, so it's the, it's the grid on the continuous features. Yeah, okay. the, FICO, the FICO data set has, um, it's all continuous features. So it's yeah. really the worst for decision trees, because for decision trees, you have right. to figure out exactly where the optimal split is, which the, makes all the features correlated with each other, and it makes the optimization problem a beast. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and, and so uh, one thing that was interesting to me was that um, you, you're fixing the number of training data points, and uh, focusing on number of features and scalability is obviously uh, very much affected uh, by by the number of features. Uh, and can you say anything about uh, scalability as a function of of data set? Yeah. Uh, Let's see. Did I include those? Let me see if I have those slides in here in this deck. I didn't want to present too many experimental results, but um, I probably have the. So it scales much. Everything scales much better in the amount of data. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here we go. I'm just going to share my screen again. Yeah, the sh scaling in the, in the amount of data is really not that impressive because um, the, the, um, all the bit vector computations, like, everything that deals with data is like bit vector computations, right? It's like evaluating the loss function. And that's all really, really fast. So um, these are, you know, this is like thousands of, of samples. And so you can, uh, yeah, you can, it, you know. So, it, so this is, it. so the y-axis is number of samples. Is this no, absolute? No, no, this, this is time, y-axis yeah. is time. And this is number of samples and it's multiplied by, I think it's a thousand. I'm not sure, I, I, check, but mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I didn't include this slide now, so I didn't, I like yeah, to yeah, slide no. and I didn't label it, so sorry about that. No problem, yeah. no problem. Yeah, just wondering. Yeah, but it's 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 pretty easy to get like, you know, most of the methods. I mean, maybe DLA 0.5 is a bit slow. Python mm -hmm. also is kind of slow, but when you do the bit vector stuff, like here's like the brown one is here, mm -hmm. um, and then the blue one is is there. So it's just it's just an easier problem to deal with number amount of data, and so yeah. Mm -hmm. Not as not as interesting. I see, and and I guess here the the third thing that would have also uh, uh, been interesting is the is the training loss and the and the testing uh, well accuracy. I guess that's a, what you're saying is that roughly it's doing a bit better at a much cheaper cost in terms of uh, sparsity or or number of leaves, right? So I have that plot too. Um, so this is training accuracy. And uh -huh. then of course generalization is just based on the amount of data in training and test sets. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to worry about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the, the, uh, this is training accuracy versus number of leaves. So it's mm -hmm. accuracy versus sparsity. Mm -hmm. And you want to be, you want to have a higher accuracy for each level. Of, yeah. You want to yeah. be up here basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like monks two is a, it's a game data set. It's like a very particular type of data. Um, and so like you can do better if you solve the problem more exactly. Mm -hmm. And so you, you see a slight advantage here, but the truth is for most problems, um, you know, it's, you're getting, you're getting essentially very similar accuracy, but with um, smaller number of leaves. So it just, mm -hmm. you see that for like 17 leaves or whatever it is for this data set, we're getting, 90 blah percent accuracy 
whereas ghost or sorry DL 8.5 needed 27 leaves to get the same accuracy. Mm -hmm. And CART never got to that point. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Um, I yeah, 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 Do I, I yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a decent trade-off. Ah, it didn't show in the hidden slides, yeah. Um, yeah, I probably have it for some more data sets, but yeah. Let's see if I can, what is this plot? I don't, I don't know what this is. This will be a surprise. Oh yeah, so training accuracy versus number of leaves. This is test accuracy versus number of leaves. Yeah, so you know, you're, you're seeing a slight advantage here for this. Like it's just, you know, smaller number of leaves, you get better accuracy. Yeah. And, and, and for, uh, for ghosts, this is obtained by uh, training with different uh, budget constraint on the on the number of leaves yeah it's just different regularization terms you right. just run the regularization all the way through it's i see not not a, not an actual heart constraint on number of leaves no we don't do okay. that okay okay mm -hmm. so you're not controlling that directly but you get it you get, it's more similar to how you would control uh the other uh like greedy tree algorithms because they can't you, you control them or not i guess well, the greedy tree algorithms, you'd control it by how much, how much pruning you do. Right, oh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, for us, you control it with this one parameter, which is the regularization parameter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, the, we don't really want to impose a hard constraint because how do you know that like the number of leaves you need is 17? Yeah, you don't. I didn't know that. <laughs> so we'd rather say like, we'll sacrifice this much error for one fewer leaf in the tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have a question in the Q&A. Um, where do you think interpretable machine learning is going in the near future? What challenge do you have in mind for your current research and what problems should people in interpretable ML focus more on? Well, I'm obviously trying to focus on the problems that I think are important. <laughs> I mean, decision trees and scoring systems have been around for, you know, like scoring systems for at least a hundred years and decision trees since the 1960s. So I think those two problems are important. Um, and then, um, so Rich Caruana, who's another interpretable machine learning researcher, is really interested in additive models. So everything he does is like additive models, which I think is cool because I think additive models are really neat. Um, he's working on more like medical records data, which is kind of in between the tabular and the neural networks problems. Um, I also have a bunch of different projects on neural net interpretable neural networks. So trying to like align the axes of the latent space with concepts that we know what they mm -hmm. are. Um, yeah, doing other kinds of case-based reasoning stuff. Um, trying so, to, yeah, go ahead. So maybe related to that, do you think, um, do you think it's worth it or, or, or there is hope uh, that one day, you know, similar to how you, you have, you know, PyTorch and TensorFlow and, and based on, you know, with a neural net type of machinery, you can relatively easily build out an initial model for quite complicated data. Um, you know, you have, a, you have a graph, you have, you know, maybe multimodal type data, et cetera. Right now, it's, it seems, regardless of, you know, what we think about interpretability in terms of like actually putting together a, an architecture very quickly and training it, that's very easy. And part of it is because just algorithmically training is easy. Uh, even if it's even if it's not principled, even if gradient descent is just a heuristic, uh, do you think there's any? Uh, do you think it's worth it to think about, um, you know, going to similar um, direction for more like interpretable type methods? Like you know, you you talked about all these different kinds of constraints that you could potentially put into the scoring or into the trees, um, in a way that makes it much more accessible to the. To the, to the user in a way. Do you think that's a... Um, so dealing with data of any kind is not easy. Um, I've never, even if I had all the optimization skills in the world, and I obviously wish I had more of them, um, there's, you know, there's always problems when you deal with data, uh, which is the reason why you need the models to be interpretable in the first place, because you have to be able to troubleshoot them more easily. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
I think even if we had better optimization tools, um, I'm not sure that we could, I'm not sure that they would always help. Uh, I'm just, I'm just being honest about that. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, other problems that we're working on now at BioLab are I'm doing a lot of matching for causal inference. <laughs> so we're trying to create match groups for really high quality causal inference um, mm -hmm. and doing that matching using fancy matching techniques, um, mm -hmm. optimization based matching techniques. Um, and then, you know, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of random stuff going on, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the, I really love some of the work that Jeff Hinton's group has been doing on, on interpretable neural networks for many years that they've been doing just like, just like I'm doing kind of k-nearest neighbory type things. They've been doing mm -hmm. nearest neighbory type things too. Mm -hmm. And they also, you know, they wrote some beautiful papers on data visualization, like TSME, for right. instance, where um, you can take the data, high dimensional data, project it down to a low dimensional space and actually see kind of what mm -hmm. structures are in the data. Um, so uh, I, I think those are all different frontiers for interpretable machine learning that would allow you to see into the patterns of the data. Um, mm -hmm. For the decision tree work, we're applying it, we're trying to apply it to material science problems right now, because mm -hmm. actually, believe it or not, material science is like tr decision trees are really, really good for certain kinds of material science problems. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that is, but like, it, it's just because of the way the, I don't know. Well, maybe their features are good somehow. The features are like just pixel, like pixels in a material. Okay, then that's, that's weird. Yeah, <laughs> so I think it's because they have transitions that are very rapid. Like, uh -huh. you know, if you change one pixel in the unit cell of a material, it actually changes the material's property completely. Mm -hmm. Um, and so because decision trees are, you know, they have these. Ah, uh, I see this. Yeah. Bins. Very strict. Yeah. Yeah. So somehow. Yeah. So I think, um, I think, you know, whenever we go, whenever we go to a different domain, whenever we go to a different healthcare domain or scientific domain, we always find some new challenge, mm -hmm. new interpretability constraints. Um, and I think, I, you know, so I'm always looking around for new problems because they challenge you in different ways to come up with new constraints and again, models that people can use to help design new materials or to get better mm -hmm. care to patients. Mm -hmm. um, let me try to answer some of yeah. the questions here. So how do you compare gradient boosting and gradient trees? Gradient boosting is rather, is rather, rather yeah. So gradient boosting is the best like out of the box method. It's been that way for many, many years. Um, it's the most trustworthy for a new set of data that you don't know anything about. Um, but of course, boosted decision trees are not optimized for sparsity and interpretability. And usually you'd compare boosted decision trees to CART. And that's not a fair comparison because boosted decision trees have been improved on year after year, whereas CART is an algorithm from 1980, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so instead of comparing gradient boosting to old time decision trees, we should try comparing boosting to new time decision trees. And then in that case, the comparison is pretty good, especially for tabular data. Like I showed, I even showed a comparison on the compass data set to gradient boosted trees and we're getting very similar accuracy. Okay, can decision tree act as an interpretable model in unstructured scenarios like vision? Okay, there's a, there's a complicated answer to that question. <laughs> Pixel lesser than threshold doesn't make much sense. No, um, in fact, pixel less than a threshold does, is not, that's not interpretable. How do you think on that? Um, quite difficult to match the accuracy of CNNs as well. Okay, so um, sparsity and the number of leaves on pixels, that's not a good measure of interpretability for computer vision, which is why we're using case-based reasoning. But I have a colleague over at NC State who's built a decision tree into his neural network uh, architecture. So he has a, a bunch of uh, convolutional layers, and then it goes into this decision tree thing at the top. Um, it's a fixed decision tree. Like he, he, he fixes, it's a full decision tree with a specific size. He fixes it, and then um, at the end, you get a classification. And you can actually go and kind of visually look at what the tree is doing at the upper layers of this network. Um, so some people really do think that it's okay to use decision trees within neural networks, but they wouldn't use it in the way you're talking about. They wouldn't use it on the raw features. Like, I think you have to do something convolutional um, uh, for computer vision data, because otherwise, it, you know, what you're doing just doesn't make sense, doesn't make that much sense. Well, I guess also relatedly, 
pre-neural net era, people used to do that. They used to have these uh, feature extractors, right, for images, and then run them through decision trees, et cetera. And, and a lot of the, the claim to fame for deep learning was that you don't need to do that and you can, you can skip the feature extraction and the, and the decision tree. Yeah, so that actually um, boosting came, came into play because of the Viola and Jones paper in computer vision. Mm -hmm. where they were using these very, very weak classifiers, right. like little detectors for horizontal line. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe any, any uh, final questions? Anybody? Uh, if I may happened. point out as well, um, the questions don't necessarily have to be about technical things or about the presentation. They could just be questions to Professor Rudin overall. So we just got another one though. So if you'd like to go ahead and answer that. Um, for the combined uh, neural network decision tree model, do you have to remember the name of the paper? I remember the name of my, my colleague. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember the name of the paper. Um, so his name is Tianfu Wu. So I'll just, I'll just type it here. Yeah. And you can go check out his website. He's got a bunch of papers on the website. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced why you, you need a decision tree in the upper layers rather than a linear model, because to me, a linear model is fine. Um, you know, our case-based reasoning methods use linear models. I think they're okay, um, but you know, Everybody has a different, different notion of interpretability, and that's totally fine. Okay, good. Any, any last questions? Okay, how do you keep up with all the literature? I don't. Um, I wish I could. I just... I, it's, it's like a, like, it's crazy. I mean, I, Elias, do you have a better way of doing this than I do? Because it's hard. Uh, uh, I'm very protective of, of my time when it comes to reading. So I will only invest in, in reading papers that I think potentially have a really good insight to something I care about. Um, but assuming that that the, whoever's asking the question is a is a graduate student maybe early on uh then I, I would say i mean at that time i used to read lots of paper all you know all kinds of papers but i, I would not claim that i could keep up particularly for for machine learning i think for for optimization and or is generally the pace is much slower um and uh and you can i i, I would say keep up to some extent uh with the with the state of the art, but in machine learning, I think in deep learning, it's it's impossible. I think it's hopeless to try to think one can 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 keep up uh, with anything beyond like a narrow topic. I don't know. That's my kind of experience. Um, okay, let, let me let me try to give a, a maybe a slightly better answer than just I give up and I don't know. Um, so one thing that I do is I I think about topics in terms of like buckets, right? I like have some sort of organization for topics in my head. So for instance, for interpretability, I separately group the post hoc methods and the um, interpretable methods. So post hoc method is where you have a black box and you try to explain it. Those methods I generally don't like very much. And because I have, a, there's a lot of reasons why those methods are not a good idea. So I generally, you know, I group those into one side and then the actual interpretable model, I group into the, into the other side. So once I have this full organization of how the fields relate to each other in my head, then I can, look at I can look at an abstract and decide which bucket it falls into mm -hmm. and decide whether it's worth reading based on what topic um, what topic it's it's in and whether and how interested I am in that particular topic um, does that help yeah that makes sense yeah we have all read the paper stop <laughs> explaining <laughs> okay yeah um, so yeah uh, yeah, so, so I, I, generally, I generally kind of view the explainability papers with a grain of salt because, and I don't know if you noticed in that paper, I was very careful not to cite the, not to cite the review papers and explainability mm -hmm. because those papers are, they very often conflate interpretability and explainability 
Um, and they also don't, like you saw how in my talk, I went to the literature back from 1960s and like back from the 1920s, all those explainability papers, they like assume that the whole world started in 2016. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they do that, but like their, their perspective's pretty messed up. Um, yeah. yeah, so I really try to avoid reading literature where I think that what they're doing is like, where it's like a novice working on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I also tend to try to read papers that are written by people whose work I trust. You know, like I would happily read Elias' papers. Thank you. <sighs> I yeah, I, I, I think, <laughs> I mean, related maybe, I wanted to comment on the explainability thing. I think one of the, one of the main issues there is using the word explainability. It implies that um, the explanation uh, refers to the actual, uh, more like the, the underlying mechanism. You know, it's, it's almost like it's implying that this is the truth and we're trying to explain it, whereas it's just explaining, meaning trying to kind of reverse engineer how the model arrived to a prediction from input to whatever output it spit out. Uh, so there's no, you know, there's <clears throat> not much more to that. Uh, and, and I guess that's where, that's where the, 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 the drift is. Some people think that that may be useful. Uh, and on the other hand, because it's, it's, you know, trying to force the model to say something that it really was not meant to say by design, uh, then, then a lot of us think that that might not be too useful. I mean, at least for understanding, for understanding that, for establishing that. I'm not going to say, you know, the interpretive model is causal, but it's certainly closer to that direction of. Um, well, you know, the, the causal, yeah, some of the, yeah. Some, some people say that it can't be interpretable unless it's causal, but that, that's wrong. It should be, it's causal if it's causal. <laughs> so that's different than interpretable. So you can have a predict, purely predictive model that has no causal anything in it. So for instance, um, the, the recidivism prediction problems. Mm -hmm. You don't commit another crime because you've had three prior crimes. Mm -hmm. Makes no sense. Yeah. Right? The, ca the causality just can't be there because it's like, why did this person commit these crimes? Well, it's because they, you know, they come from a family of drug addicts. I mean, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and that that doesn't go into those models, so they're not causal at all. Um, but yeah, whether 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 there's naturally an explanation that comes with the model, like you don't need an extra explanation; it already comes with it. It's interpretable. Um, or whether you have to take the black box and like come up with some <sighs> approximation of it. Mm -hmm. I think part of the issue is really just the terminology. Like it's just not okay to call an approximation an explanation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this was all started by the line paper with yes. this misleading sales pitch. Mm -hmm. and, you know, why, why should I trust you? But the answer is no, you shouldn't trust it. You shouldn't trust it. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, it's um, Lime is like right now, it's like the straw man, you know, it's like everybody's straw man because it's really easy to beat, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's I guess that has to do with both what you said about people discovering or thinking that the literature on this started in say 2016. Uh, and also the issue with keeping up is that for many people, actually, it's it's not that easy to figure out the literature because anyway they're overwhelmed with the stuff that's coming out every single day on archive uh, and i think like from a from a perspective of say of a graduate student that can be very very distracting and very you know discouraging in many ways and, you know they, they're working on one or two projects and they see 20 related papers coming out every day then Oh, well, there aren't, luckily there aren't too many fairly narrow subfields where there are 20 papers coming up per day, I don't mm -hmm. think, right? Um, so as yeah. long, as, long right. as you've narrowed your interests enough, you should be okay. Yeah. Um, just because right. like for any like really good, you know, think about the, I mean, even Michael Jordan who produces papers at a rate that I can't even fathom, um, mm -hmm. like even he, you know, there's not that many people at that caliber producing papers at that speed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as long as you kind of are able to sort the papers into the ones you need to look at and ones you don't, um, it might be easier. 
yeah, I guess, I guess the, the, the consensus is that have a good sorting mechanism by actually defining what you care about, then it becomes much easier. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's the advice. Okay, and um, I think for the question about differentiating between explainability and interpretability, I think we've, Cynthia's already addressed this one. And then somebody's interested in doing a PhD with you, uh, I guess you can follow up on that offline yeah, maybe. Um, um, uh, the, the first person, so the, that the answer to that question is in a paper called Stop Explaining Black Box Machine Learning Models for High Stakes Decisions and Use Interpretable Models Instead. That's actually the title of the paper. So if you go to my website and you search for the word stop, you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> I should say it was please stop. It was, it was supposed to be a little more polite, but they made me remove the word please. <laughs> so it's now just stop doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Rudin, just for, for um, I guess, for ease of access, would it be possible for you to put your website and your email within the chat? So if anybody would like to access those, they'd be able to find them. I'm sure, but you could just Google me in this, the first hit. Okay. Um, and then um, my website, I don't even know what the website is. So just, just Google me and you'll find it. Okay, um, I, 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 I Googled it. Google myself. I got you, I, I posted it. Great, okay. Okay, somebody's joking that now there is work in the field of evaluation of explainable methods. Yes. Which is <laughs> Yes, there are workshops on this stuff, that's true. I just, I don't, I know a lot of people do these, like a lot of human studies, and I really try to avoid human studies because the problem is they're, they're not accurate. You can, you can change one, the way the question is, question is worded, and you get a different result from the human subject experiment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell you anything about how interpretable your method is. Mm -hmm. So I'm just a little bit wary of all these papers that like use all these human subject experiments to try to evaluate. Like, to be honest, the, the real way you evaluate the, um, the usefulness of it is to, is to work with a domain expert who can tell you what the value yes. of them and their field mm -hmm. is. Um, I don't know why that's not good enough anymore, but maybe it's because people aren't actually working on high stakes decisions where they actually care about the, I yeah. don't know, who knows, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that will be very application dependent uh, in a sense, and even for the practitioners maybe, they might have their own implicit criteria for why they like an interpretable method. And then they might be convinced enough to the point where they don't actually care about a, such a study. I mean, for practical purposes, they're happy with the, with the outputs and they're able to use them. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, very often they don't really even know what all of the criteria are. So if you give them an interpretable right. model, they can choose one among them without knowing exactly why um, that that why that one is more useful in practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. well, I don't know Great. that we have I any other we questions at up. this moment. So yeah. Sorry, Laura. Okay, can you go in? Sorry, I was just saying I don't think we have any other questions at the moment. Okay. So we should we can wrap up. Um, I don't uh, know if you have any final words, Professor. Thanks so much for for your time and patience and for the very nice talk. Thank you for inviting me. Wish we could have invited you in person, but I guess we'll, we'll let that for another uh, year, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.